Hello, and welcome to another one of our Invest for Success Masterclasses. Today's topic is managing risk when buying property. My name is Stephen Vick. I'm the Managing Director of National Property Advisory. I spent over 30 years in the property and finance industry, and I'm the founder of the Nexus Private Group of Companies. We don't have a guest speaker today, it's just me, but there's a lot of content to get through that covers a fairly broad spectrum of knowledge areas and not just one specialized field. So forgive me if I talk too fast or go all monotone on you. Uh, we're recording this so all registrants will get a copy to watch back if you miss something. Just a couple of housekeeping items. If you drop out at all, just refresh your browser and click on the link again and that should get you straight back in. If you have any questions, type them into the panel on the right hand side and I'll try to get to as many as I can by the end of this session. If you make it to the end, I do have a special offer for you that is worth sticking around for. So I will try not to bore you. The content is quite dense and content rich. So my competitors watching this should be licking their lips. Uh, so I, I hope you've had your coffee and gotten rid of any distractions like the kids, the dogs, the TV, etc. And we shall get going. Before we get started, I'll give you some time to read the following disclaimer. So who is this masterclass for? It's not really targeted at first home buyers, although they will certainly get something from it. It's more for subsequent homeowners and investors, perhaps those that have made a start in their wealth journey but are looking at the next step or how to optimize their position and build a significant portfolio that's a bit more bespoke. However, I'm sure that no matter what your property experience, you will learn something new today. So let's get into it. So what is risk as it relates to purchasing and owning property? Loss is a type of risk, it could be financial loss, it could be loss of your time or your headspace, and it could be opportunity loss, you know, the loss of having your money not invested elsewhere. It could be damage, of course, you know, damage to property, financial damage, of course, poor decisions can result in financial distress, which can damage your relationships, both your personal relationships and your professional relationships. And of course, it can damage your own mental health. Negative and suboptimal outcomes are also a risk. For owner occupiers, it could mean just not meeting your family's requirements. For investors, a suboptimal return on investment can be as a result of a bad decision. Or simply not meeting your personal goals or living your best life is also suboptimal, of course. So, how do we deal with risk? We all have different risk tolerances, and our tolerances can even be different for when we're buying an owner-occupied property than when we're buying an investment property. Also, you may have different tolerances at various stages of life. Some people, when they get a bit older, of course, their risk tolerances uh, will reduce. There's no one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to property investing. Uh, everything needs to be balanced up and slotted into your property investment strategy. But here's a few ways of dealing with risk. We can control risk. So we can make allowances for potential risks, premeditate those risks, circumvent them. This is the old stitch in time saves nine. You know, maybe just doing a few things that can avoid potential risk coming up in the future. We can certainly transfer the risk. So this means, you know, we can use insurances. We can pay for insurance premiums to pass on those risks to, to another company. We can outsource our risk, simply getting good advice from professionals and perhaps even outsourcing the risk onto their professional indemnity insurance. We can also just accept the risk. We may weigh up the possible outcome versus the cost of transferring or controlling it and decide to just accept any potential setbacks. Of course, some risks are far too great to control or transfer. So we shouldn't let our greed override a high probability of failure and just avoid these risks altogether. So control, transfer, accept, or avoid. You'll see those concepts come up a bit today. One thing I will say at this point is that it's important to be aware of as many risks as possible before purchasing property because these things should make up part of your overall investment strategy and chopping and changing your strategy is a surefire way to destroy your wealth. 
So let's have a look at some of the risks. We'll start with funding risk. This is at the point of purchase. When you're looking to buy property and sign a contract, there's a few things we need to be aware of. The first is the finance clause. This is within the purchase contract if you're borrowing to purchase, of course. A finance clause will generally make the contract subject to you receiving funding from your chosen lender so that if you can't get the funding, you don't have to buy the property. If your contract is not subject to finance and you can't settle on the property, you can risk losing your deposit and possible litigation from the vendor. The finance clause will also stipulate the times you must meet for finance approval and settlement. If the bank is not ready to settle on time, you may have to pay default interest. Getting this stuff wrong can be very expensive, so you've got to understand your obligations and the potential costs before signing the contract. Bank criteria and policy changes. Uh, interest rates can move throughout the loan application and settlement process, and banks can simply change their lending policies. This may change the serviceability or general lending criteria used in ascertaining your borrowing capacity. This is more likely if you have a long-term settlement. You could also experience changes to your personal circumstances throughout this time. Things like changing jobs or income, falling pregnant or taking personal loans out or new credit cards will also affect your borrowing capacity, putting your deposit at risk. Long settlements, if you're looking to buy off the plan, you might get a bank pre-approval for a certain amount, but the banks will normally only hold these for three months. So if your settlement is longer than this, you'll usually be asked for updated information like pay slip statements, etc., before they'll commit to settlement. Changes in your personal circumstances during this time may prevent you from settling. And again, your deposit could be forfeited. The vendor also has the right to seek compensation from you to recover their resale costs if you can't settle. Valuations. Values can be, well, shall we say, inconsistent. They don't have a lot of incentive to take any risk, especially when they work for the bank, and often they take a conservative view. This can be really frustrating when trying to access maximum equity from your strategy. Just keep in mind though, valuation should not be relied upon to assess the real value of your property. A good agent will usually give you a lot better indication to where the market is at. A low valuation on your home though, or the property you're purchasing, can mean that you're unable to settle if this is not a condition of your contract. And again, you risk losing your deposit and having to pay the developer's resale costs. Your holding costs can also blow out during construction if the build times blow out. The interest charges on the land, combined with the interest charges during the drawdown phase, can really add up while you wait for completion and may change your ultimate LVR or loan to value ratio. This could result in the bank withholding funds, meaning that the builder is unable to complete your home. So how do we manage funding risk? Firstly, speak to your mortgage broker or real estate agent about timing of finance approvals and settlement. Be sure to understand your mortgage needs and the bank's requirements. That means understanding what ownership structures and loan structures you need before signing a contract. For example, if you're using equity for your deposit and costs and you're not cross-collateralizing, your mortgage broker will need to submit two mortgage applications and it will simply take longer. Or if you're purchasing in your SMSF or in a trust, you should request longer approval and settlement periods. Speak to your accountant if necessary and your mortgage broker before looking for property and speak to your agent about negotiating longer finance terms upfront. Bank criteria and bank policy changes. Be honest with your mortgage broker and discuss your family plans and your future expense needs. Don't go to your maximum borrowing capacity if possible. Make sure you qualify at more than one bank also, just in case your bank reaches their exposure limit on a particular project and they don't want to lend on that project anymore. And have your mortgage broker build in buffers, both for equity provisions and your serviceability. So for long settlements, get contract advice before signing, not just a conveyancing service especially if it's an off the plan or build contract. We'll discuss this a little bit more later. Valuations, 
don't cross collateralize. This will allow you to isolate the gains in one of your properties to access equity without other property dragging down your overall equity position. Allow a valuation or equity buffer. It's better to go conservatively with your budget spend rather than risking your deposit. Your real estate agent should escort the valuer through the property and provide them with comparable sales, just making their job a little bit easier. Finally, use a mortgage broker so that you have backup lending options. If you're building a house, calculate your holding costs on the land and the drawdowns throughout the construction phase and allow for time blowouts. And finally, make sure your hired guns are communicating for your benefit. We manage this process for all of our clients, coordinating all parties and stakeholders to ensure a smooth and seamless process and to reduce the purchase or funding risk. Next up, cash flow risk. If you don't calculate your purchase costs correctly, you may be short of what's required to settle. You must allow for things like stamp duty, bank costs, legal fees, possible lender's mortgage insurance, and any settlement adjustments. Also make provisions for extras such as buyer's agency fees, other professional fees, service connection fees, and any capital expenses like curtains and blinds, which aren't normally included in new builds. When it comes to holding costs, don't just do a back of the envelope rent covers mortgage calculation. Calculate all ongoing expenses, especially if it's an investment property, such as water and rates, body corporate fees, maintenance, home insurance, landlord's insurance, property management fees, relet fees, and any additional accounting fees. You should also allow for vacancies if it's rented, and of course, movements in interest rates. On the plus side, don't forget to add back the depreciation, if there's any, and other tax offsets like purchase costs and lender's mortgage insurance. So how to manage cash flow risk. Ask your mortgage broker or bank manager for an estimated settlement statement as early as possible. Get a building and pest inspection done prior to going unconditional to uncover any significant maintenance issues. Ask your agent about any known pending expense items. Obtain a depreciation estimate from the builder or agent, but eventually make sure that you get a property quantity surveyor's report. You usually get a lot more deductions when you use a quantity surveyor's report. Request the body corporate schedule for apartments, including the sinking fund details, to make sure there's no structural issues, pending litigation, or any other anomalous expenses. Check on breaches of the subsequent property rule for new properties. I'll discuss this a bit more later, but it can significantly affect your cash flow, so you need to be aware of this before signing. Obtain rental appraisals from local agents and compare with other valuation methods like CoreLogic. Check both current and historical suburb vacancy rates. Apply for a PAYG tax variation from your accountant. This will help you with your cash flow. It's basically a way of getting all your tax rebates for negatively geared property back in your weekly pay packet rather than waiting till the end of the financial year to receive one lump sum. This money is obviously a lot better sitting in your offset account than in the ATO's account all year. Perform a sensitivity analysis. A sensitivity analysis can be performed within an Excel spreadsheet and just shows the results of an event or an outcome that is contingent on two variables. In this example, we can see what effects movements in both interest rates and rent can have on the weekly holding costs. With all current inputs, this property is expected to have an after-tax cost to the investor of $37 per week, that number in the middle there. If interest rates were to go from, say, 5% to 6%, but rent stays the same, the holding cost will increase to $144 a week. If the rent were to drop by $50 per week, but interest rates stay the same, then the holding cost would increase to $62 a week. If both of these events happen, then the holding cost would increase to $168 a week. Sensitivity analysis can be formed on all sorts of variables, like your vacancy rate, rental escalation rates, growth rates, etc. This is something that we do for all of our clients when assessing the long-term cash flow effects. Finally, seek property investment advice. 
experience really counts here. Having the experience of applying that knowledge that really makes a difference. And it's not what you make at the margin that will make or break you. You know, it's not the, do you buy the best property in the world or the second best property? And do you, do you make a little bit more? It's really what getting it wrong costs you. A wrong investment decision often puts families off investing for a number of years, which of course has a huge impact on their long-term wealth trajectory. Buying or building property off the plan is another risk. I'm not going to spend much time on this because this was the topic of our last masterclass. However, it certainly is topical at the moment and worth including in our risk assessment. We've discussed funding already, but as a reminder, build in buffers for settlement and serviceability. Make sure you get good professional advice and ensure your advisors are communicating. In my mind, it's imperative to have an experienced mortgage broker in your corner when you're trying to build a significant property portfolio. Be wary of build contracts at the moment. There's no such thing as a fixed price contract for houses. Contract prices can blow out significantly because of things like soil tests, uh, possible increases in labor costs and building materials, or delays in completion. For house and land purchases, you'll also need to pay interest on the land and the construction drawdowns while the house is being built, if you've borrowed for the purchase, of course. Most apartments and townhouses are sold as a single fixed contract, and it's the developer that bears the holding costs throughout the construction phase. However, when purchasing an apartment or townhouse, the price can still rise prior to completion if the developers rely on a get out of jail free clause. These are clauses usually buried deep within the contract and that allow the builder or developer to either increase the price or terminate the contract for one reason or another. This may be as a consequence of supply chain issues or labor shortages, the project may no longer be financially feasible, or it could even be as a result of changes to their funding arrangements by their lenders. Termination after a substantial period of time would represent an opportunity cost to you. That being having your deposit tied up and not invested somewhere else. For all off the plan purchases, get building contract advice and only use well-heeled developers and builders with a proven track record. Sunset clauses. A sunset clause usually gives both parties to a contract the opportunity to terminate if settlement has not occurred within a certain period of time, usually about three to five years. Having a sunset clause that's too long in an instance where the project never gets off the ground means that your deposit is tied up and you lose the opportunity to invest that money elsewhere. Having a sunset clause that's too short could mean that if the value of the property has increased significantly over that time, the developer could terminate the contract and resell the property at a higher price. Again, you've missed an opportunity here. If you're an investor, ensure the developer is committed to commence the construction and go long on the sunset period. You'll be reducing the risk and increasing the probability of a positive outcome with a long settlement. Construction risk diminishes significantly once construction has commenced. And remember, developers don't like paying holding costs either, so they won't delay unnecessarily. Delays for any reason can mean lost opportunity or increased holding costs throughout construction. If it's your owner-occupied home and construction lingers on, your family needs may not be met and you might need to make other living arrangements. Developers that are builders have an advantage because they're not relying on third parties and usually have more control over the supply and labor agreements. Be sure to use builders with proven track record of delivery and delivering a similar product. Project risk. We'll start with flooding. Buying in a flood zone can threaten property damage, of course, and cause significant expenses, particularly if you're unable to get insurance for that property. It, it can also result in poor resale value and rentability. Keep in mind that anything built since 2011 must satisfy the new building requirements at the new 100-year flood line. Neighboring developments or future development can cause impacts on views, noise, livability, and rentability. Infrastructure projects. Future projects like new roads, train lines, communication towers, etc., can affect the resale value and your rental yield. Development approvals. I'm against purchasing property without a development approval. 
Some developers will start marketing the project before they have a DA, but the project may still be subject to, say, an impact assessment or community objection and consequently experience long delays. They may not ever get it off the ground. It is very common to see changes to your property design, floor plan, your aspect, and even the price post DA approval. And there'll be clauses in the contract to allow this without challenge from the purchaser. Subsequent ownership. I mentioned this earlier, and this can have a real effect on your cash flow. The reason being is you can only claim depreciation addbacks on the fixtures and fittings of the property if it's a new property or newly renovated. Sometimes even when you're buying direct from the developer, upon completion, they may switch the ownership into another entity. This will trigger a subsequent property ownership and can significantly affect the cash flow or and or your return on investment for many years. Another thing that will trigger the subsequent property ownership rule is that if you have a tenant already in the property when you settle on it and settlement occurs after six months from the construction completion date, that will also trigger the rule. Tenancy risk. Not having rent at fair market value can result in having unnecessary vacancies. Get advice from a good property manager for this. Not doing background checks on tenants or regular inspections can mean permanent damage to your asset. It can mean repair costs, a possible legal action, lost income, and of course, headspace. Community title schemes. There are a number of new schemes emerging that contain unfair service agreements or limitations or covenants on your property use. So how do we manage these project risks? You can download a council flood map and check the property's insurability with your insurance company. With neighbouring developments, ask your agent and approve all conveyances recommended searches. You can also check online on the state development website for DA applications and approvals in the area. Infrastructure projects, pretty much the same as neighbouring developments. Uh, DA approvals, check with your agent at the first opportunity to ensure a DA has been achieved before you spend any time looking at the property. Subsequent ownership, again, check with your agent. They should have the info. Tenancy risk, engage an experienced and mature property manager who knows what they're doing. Community title schemes, Find a very good property lawyer, one who's worked on both sides, both for the developer and for purchases. If you watch the highlights reel from our last masterclass, where our guest speaker was Niall Powell from JHK Legal, you really understand what I mean here. Remember, National Property Advisory can help you out with all of these things, just to mitigate any project risk that you may experience. Next up, product risk. This can refer to the quality of product. If you're buying off the plan, will it look like the brochure? Will I just want to upgrade my principal place of residence again because it doesn't meet my, my family needs and go and incur more entry and exit costs? What is the likelihood of non-completion and what is the cost? Does the developer have funding? Have pre-sale conditions being met by the developer? And has construction commenced? Poor net yield. You do need to understand what the expected maintenance costs might be on the property that you're purchasing, what the suburb's vacancy rate is, and the expected rental escalation over the years. What is the suburb's livability score? Will I have changes to future income and therefore the tax rebates that I've forecasted? For poor growth, small differences in growth rates matter. Suburbs do most of the heavy lifting when it comes to growth rates. And history shows that there's definitely a correlation between being closer to major employment hubs and having higher growth rates. Poor growth can result in suboptimal return on investment and of course in achieving your personal and family goals. How to manage product risk. When recommending property options to our clients, we conduct our own research and due diligence, which is quite an involved process but essential in preventing mistakes. The quality of product is so important. We report on developers, builders' reputation, experience, maybe any awards that they've won, and their development history. We assess the standard of inclusions 
and reconcile with the renders, you know, the pretty pictures in the brochure. We encourage our clients to have building inspections done and handover inspections carried out. When it comes to possible non-completion for off the plan or home builds, we check the developer's reputation and standing within the industry. Their track record and their funding position is really important. We check to see if any pre-sale conditions have been met and report on expected completion dates. Experiencing a poor net yield is a real risk to investors as well. It's important to look to the future for expected maintenance expenses and get any building and pest inspections done. Look for suburbs with high average incomes. Hire a quantity surveyor to calculate actual depreciation. Don't use estimates. If seeking a neutral or positive cash flow, buy new or newly renovated for high depreciation with low maintenance costs and high rental yield. There are lots of other things that can be done to reduce your holding costs and improve your net yield. When it comes to the risk of poor capital growth, check the suburb median growth rates and historical sales. What's the location? Is it close to employment hubs, essential services and lifestyle amenity? Does it have point of difference? Does it appeal to the owner occupier when you eventually go to sell? Again, National Property Advisory has its own research and due diligence process to handle these things. And we do a thorough check with all of all of this stuff to ensure high growth rates for investors. Diversification risk. There's a number of different ways that you can diversify. Firstly, asset class. Is property even the right thing to be investing in? And do you want all of your capacity in this one asset class? If you're not sure, you should speak to a financial planner. If property, then what venture does your strategy allow for? Are you a developer, a flipper, a yield chaser, or a growth seeker? You could be following a strategy that's not right for your circumstances. Product type. Should you invest in commercial, industrial, retail, or residential property? Should it be a house, townhouse, or apartment? What are you looking to achieve in terms of growth and the yield trade-off? Geography. Have you put all of your eggs into the one basket? Does something like a council rezoning impact your entire portfolio? Are you invested in a regional area where your growth and rental prospects are reliant on one industry, such as maybe mining, tourism, or defense? Ownership entities, are you exposed to creditors, litigation, or potential land tax? And finally, banks and lenders. Does one bank have you trapped? How to manage diversification risk. Firstly, on asset class, seek advice from a qualified financial planner. When it comes to the venture, build a strategy that takes into consideration your risk appetite, your investment horizon, your financial capacity, your knowledge and experience, your personal time, and your personal involvement. When it comes to product type, build a strategy that considers your budget your yield requirement, and your growth aspirations. These are inevitable trade-offs. Geography, diversify in terms of suburbs, cities, or states you invest in. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Ownership structures, get advice and consider using different ownership entities as your portfolio grows to limit financial exposure or even to avoid land tax. Banks and lenders, don't cross collateralize when building an investment portfolio. Give yourself some flexibility here. Get a borrowing capacity from multiple lenders. Tax and compliance risk. Firstly, litigation. You can unnecessarily risk loss from legal action uh, by not utilizing trusts or company structures where there is a risk of litigation given your business or personal affairs. Accounting. Accounting risk can mean paying too much or not enough tax. Uh, claiming interest on loans where deposits were taken from offset accounts is a common mistake by accountants and those doing their own tax returns. This can result in a nasty financial shock if audited by the ATO. Regulatory penalties. I'm setting up SMSFs incorrectly, using inadequate trust deeds, or getting the timing wrong and naming conventions wrong when buying property in your SMSF are really common mistakes that can cost you things like double stamp duty, non-compliance, penalties, 
or even adverse tax consequences. How to manage tax and compliance risk. When it comes to litigation, just get advice from an accountant early on. When it comes to your ongoing accounting, find an accountant who specializes in investing. Regulatory penalties. Do your own research here. Speak to professionals who are experienced in these types of transactions, and it pays to also get a second opinion. Of course, there's lots of other risks involved in buying an investment property, uh, and I'm not gonna cover, I can't cover everything of course today, but uh, I did want to start off with talking about opportunity risk and what that means. And it may pay to give an example here. Let's say that you have the opportunity to uh, be a renovator or just buy an investment property and take a long-term buy and hold type strategy. You've got to look at what's required when you are a flipper. Obviously, you've got the holding costs of that property uh, while you're going through the, the renovation process. You have other costs like paying for the interest on that particular loan or holding that property whilst it's untenanted. Uh, you have all sorts of other contingencies to be aware of. Uh, if you flip immediately, you might up might end up not getting the concession on the capital gains tax. Um, so there's lots of things to consider there. When you add all those up and compare that to just using all of your equity, being in one property, maybe even two properties for the same cost and achieving a really good growth over that time, it may, when compared to the flipper uh, strategy, it may actually compare to be a lot better off. So uh, flipping is a, a really good example or doing other types of ventures is a really good example of how you have to really take a good look at what the opportunity cost is to you. Timing risk. Buying high and selling low or buying and selling too often often destroys wealth. Don't try to time the market. If the cost of holding a property is small, then the risk of a quick market uplift is, it tends to be far greater and more devastating than your cost of being in the market. Always buy property when you can afford to. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. When property is charging, so are interest rates and your ability to borrow, your service ability, often diminishes throughout that time as well. Uh, the longer that you're in the market, of course, the greater the probability you have of a, of a positive outcome. Transfer or disposal risk. When you're selling or disposing of an asset, or in the event of death, divorce, illness, accident, or even incapacity, there's always a transfer risk. This could be in the form of unwanted tax to beneficiaries, or the inability of you or your spouse to maintain investments or the family home. Be sure to put an estate plan in place that includes a power of attorney, an executor, addresses death benefit nominations, and even a medical directive. Make sure you use a solicitor who specializes in estate planning for this. The wills that you can get from a news agency are simply not worth the paper that they're written on. If you've got complex circumstances or you've got teenage children or blended families, discuss the use of a testamentary trust with your estate planning solicitor. Strategy risk. Make sure you have a well-structured and well-understood long-term investment strategy that you're comfortable with and stick to it. Make sure your spouse or fellow investors are on board. Don't focus on the product. Focus on the strategy. The strategy does 80% of the heavy lifting. Have realistic expectations of returns. There's going to be good years and there's going to be bad years. It's funny, over time, wealth tends to creep up on you. Believe in the power of compound growth. Take a long view and don't chase hot spots. They may be hot for a couple of years, but if this is at the cost of solid long-term growth, it could be costing you millions of dollars. How can National Property Advisory help you? Of course, we do a lot with our clients in terms of building investment strategy and creating portfolios 
of significance. And what does that mean? Of course, the significance is a significance to you. What is it trying to achieve? What's your reason for even trying to invest, trying to get ahead? They're the things that are really important to know and understand so that you can stay invested in a long-term strategy, particularly when there's a lot of people telling you that you're doing the wrong thing or there's a lot of media noise out there. We also offer buyer's agency and advocacy services. We're also specialists in residential property, Australia-wide. We have access to new or established property. We have houses, townhouses, and apartments. We have exclusive access to new projects and off-market transactions. We perform a lot of research and due diligence, as I've discussed. We get involved in the negotiation and transaction. We play a key part in that for our clients. We do contract administration and settlement services. So that's holding your hand throughout the entire process. Of course, we do property management and we really work for you, the investor, when it comes to property management, uh, not on behalf of the tenant and we don't kind of play the middle ground on that. I think we do a very good job of property management. We have access to financial planning, accounting, mortgage broking and legal services via our affiliate partners that we've been working with for a long time. We have dedicated relationship managers for our members, sort of acting as like a financial concierge services, keeping you accountable to your goals and liaising with any external specialists where required. Most of our clients, not all, but a lot of our clients engage with us over the long term to meet their long term goals. We also provide access or exclusive access to projects, invitations to industry events, ongoing education, and of course the mentorship to our members. In a nutshell, we can pretty much help you with everything that we've discussed today. We have a great team of experienced and talented people that just love to help. With that said, I'll segue into tonight's offer. If you're watching this and you see the pop-up there, click on it, you will gain access to a 90-minute consultation with no obligation and at no cost to you. This is valued at $550. Actually, it's I think it's worth a lot more than $550, but hey, that's what we've always charged for these appointments. This will allow us to understand your circumstances and your property goals and begin to discuss strategy and how we may help you reach your personal goals and your life aspirations. We'd love to find out what's important to you and what your best life looks like. If you're still with me and you have some questions, please go ahead and type them in the question panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you're not watching this live, because we will be restreaming it, still feel free to ask questions and we can come back to you directly to try and answer them. So our first question is, I already have an investment property but don't have a solid investment strategy. Can you help? We most certainly can. And I think really taking into consideration your existing investment property and all the financial circumstances around that, the loans and everything else, is, is key to being able to look at what your next move may be. We may be able to mitigate some risks you're currently unaware of, or we may simply able, be able to make uh, different moves when you come to go buy the next property so that we can actually allow for that. It's often not necessary or worth it to actually just go and buy another property just to replace it, um, unless there's something terribly wrong with that property. But of, of course, you just need to take that into consideration with the things that you do next. And it could even be just some funding things that we actually have to change initially. So the next question is, I purchased property through the pandemic and now my interest rates have tripled. Can you help? Uh, yeah, look, there's often a number of things that can be done to alleviate the financial stress, particularly through difficult times and in periods of high interest rates. Uh, it may be being able to take some equity out to use that as a buffer, maybe even changing to a, uh, switching over to an interest only, or really having a look at the, without knowing your circumstances, of course, I can't really comment too much, but there's usually lots of things that we can do to help in these circumstances. In terms of interest rates, look, I, I think there's some good news on the horizon. It's my belief 
that interest rates will come down before the end of this year. Uh, if we look at the US CPI rates, inflation rates, uh, we can see that they've come down considerably over the last few months. Australia's is following. We obviously always lag a little bit and we are now on the downward trajectory as well. I can't see that really pulling up anytime soon. And the RBA certainly has their sights on a target of back to about three to three and a half percent by the end of next year. So I think you will see some relief. And certainly, again, for people that are in a position to buy property, it, it, it might be a good idea to ignore the, the pain that's going on out there and jump on board while you can, because there will be probably an amount of money that's sitting on the sidelines that comes back into the market when those rates come down. And who knows, banks might come up or, or legislators might come up with a whole lot of other reasons why you won't be able to borrow money uh, at that time. Next question is, I have bought my first home and I don't know how to take the next step to buy an investment property, given that I already have a mortgage. A lot of people aren't still aware that they can use the equity that they've built up on their, in their home. Uh, for instance, you know, if you've paid this much for your home and it's risen over time, that's creating available equity. You can actually use that equity as a deposit to go and buy another property. Now, you might think that you might not have much, but you, you may be surprised, particularly over the last couple of years, of what's happened to property prices. And if you get a good valuation on the property, or you can get a good valuation on the property, uh, you might be surprised at what you can do. Now, in terms of affording the repayments on it, well, it's going to depend on what type of property that you buy. But you can certainly buy properties in today's market that still cost you about zero, close to zero to hold on to. That's after all of the costs, all the interest charges and the costs and everything. And that's even with borrowing 100% of the value of the new property. In fact, 104 or 5% because you can borrow for the stamp duty and, and, and all the bank fees and all that sort of thing as well. So you may be able to use the equity borrow the entire amount and have the property completely pay for itself so that it does not uh, impact your lifestyle or your finances whatsoever. And of course, there would still be other things that we would put in place to make sure that you're, you're not kind of uh, living on the edge, so to speak, and you, you have buffers and all that kind of thing in place. So that's something that we help people with quite a bit and we'd love to talk to you about what the options are for you. Thanks for tuning in to our masterclass. Don't forget that the best time to buy property and be looking for property is now. In fact, I think it's an excellent time to be looking for property right now. Book on the registration button for your free strategy session and take advantage of the opportunity today. Until next time, I wish you all the very best on your investment journey and we'll see you next time.